Good morning. Welcome once again to the Global Philanthropy Forum. My name is Esther Hewlett, and it is my great pleasure to begin the day by wishing you all a happy and peaceful International Women's Day. This morning, just before the conference, I ran into my good friend Ann Murray, who is a mentor for many of us involved in the international women's issues. And Ann said, you know, this is International Women's Day, and you really should think about trying to paraphrase, paraphrase what Desmond Tutu said, his wonderful comment last night, about if we clothe a child, we make the gods smile. Because today, we also want to be sure that we make the goddesses smile. Especially after the many conversations yesterday that highlighted the importance of giving to women, I think it's really wonderfully appropriate that we're celebrating this International Women's Day at a conference on global philanthropy. It's a timely opportunity to focus our philanthropic lens on women. This happens to be a focus that's particularly close to my heart because my own personal philanthropy history began with an investment in women with a donation to the Global Fund for Women several years ago when the organization was just starting up. There were two things that drew me to support of international women's issues. The first is what you might call humanitarian or social justice reasons. Women are disproportionately affected in a number of ways. Seventy percent of the world's people living in extreme poverty are women. Two-thirds of the world's illiterate are women. Women perform 60 to 80 percent of the agricultural labor in much of the world, yet own only one percent of the land. Only 14 percent of parliamentary seats worldwide are held by women. These are just a few examples of some of the things that remain out of balance. But beyond these uh, social justice reasons, the second is a very compelling practical reason. We face some truly urgent problems on our shared planet, and we need all the help we can get to solve them. Violence, disease, environmental degradation, too many people combined with overconsumption of resources, which together is overtaxing the, the carrying capacity of our Earth. The list goes on and on. And an empowered woman is a tremendous resource for finding solutions to these problems. I'm continually amazed by the impact of relatively small amounts of money, and I'm talking here amounts of money in the neighborhood of maybe $5,000, when this money is put directly in the hands of women in their communities. And this impact is magnified by ripple effects and also by connections among these women. It's really an incredible network and a, a great uh, vehicle for constructive change in the world. One of my friends from the Global Fund is a woman named Wu Qing, who is an English teacher at the Beijing Foreign Studies Institute, and she's also a tireless advocate for women. She's always on the front lines, always active. When she describes herself, Wu Qing likes to say, I am a verb. <laughs> so, Senator Hillary Clinton, who's a longtime advocate for women's rights and women's voices around the world, also might well be described as a verb. One of the things that I admire the most about Hillary Clinton is her willingness to just put herself out there, to use her position and her platform to speak out on behalf of women's issues. She's been a champion for women and girls for more than 30 years, and we are honored today that she's prepared some remarks for us via videotape. So it is a great pleasure to introduce a message from Senator Hillary Clinton. I'm pleased to have this opportunity to send my best wishes to all of you gathered for the Global Philanthropy Forum at Stanford University. As the proud parent of a certain recent graduate, I have great appreciation for this extraordinary university. I wish I could be there with you in person as you observe International Women's Day 
by participating in this important discussion. I want to begin by thanking Jane Wales and the World Affairs Council for their involvement in organizing today's forum. I'd also like to recognize the Stanford University School of Business, the Hewlett Foundation, and the Tosa Foundation for sponsoring this event. There is no better day than International Women's Day to come together to discuss the significance of the work that we can do supporting women around the world. And there is no better time than the present to remind us of the importance of working at home and abroad to assure that the human rights of women everywhere are protected. For many years, we have been celebrating International Women's Day by stressing a lesson that has proven true time and time again. When women's rights are respected, when women are guaranteed a seat at the table, whether it's the kitchen table or the boardroom table or the political table, and when women are provided with economic and political opportunities, poverty is alleviated, economies are strengthened, and governmental corruption decreases. We know that when women are afforded an opportunity to make decisions about our own lives, governments and economies prosper, and entire nations benefit. And we also know there is no investment that pays greater dividends than educating a girl. At this time, our collective outrage at the horrors inflicted upon the women and children of Afghanistan should strengthen this lesson and our resolve. Under the Taliban, we saw that women were deprived of their most basic rights and denied a voice in their society. I recently held a hearing on Capitol Hill so that my colleagues and I would have the opportunity to hear directly from exiled Afghan women who desire to return and contribute to the reconstruction of their country. Afghan women have told me how important their Vital Voices leadership training was for them and how we need to support this moment of possibility to help them reclaim their rights by making long-term investments in their futures. I believe we need to act with a greater sense of commitment on the individual, philanthropic, corporate, and governmental levels to make the kinds of lasting investments in women and children that we know will bring stability and prosperity to nations as well as a better future to our world. I hope this conference will result in the kinds of contributions that revitalize communities by giving women the tools they need to become full participants in their society. You know that wonderful quote from Margaret Mead, who said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world? Well, I have seen firsthand in my travels around the world the truth of that statement. In programs from Haiti to Egypt, from Ukraine to South Africa, I've seen how individuals and foundations are making crucial investments in people that promise to continue to produce results in the years to come. We have invested too little in the kinds of programs that produce the greatest dividends and I believe we should place greater emphasis on investing in women and children. Thank you for the opportunity to be a long-distant participant in this forum. I look forward to hearing about your discussion, and I congratulate you on all of the work you are doing to bring opportunities to women and girls around the world. Thank you, Senator Clinton, from afar for some inspiring words. Uh, there's a definition of philanthropy that I like very much. It's from an organization called Learning to Give. It goes like this. Philanthropy is giving time, talent, or treasure for the sake of another or the common good. Of course, treasure or, or money is a very, very much an important part of the philanthropy equation. But the time and talent of personal involvement are very important, too. Our next speaker, Mavis Leno, is an exemplary philanthropist in the fullest sense of the word. As the chair of the Feminist Majority Foundation's Campaign for Afghan Women and Girls, she's been actively involved in uh, Afghanistan since 1997. Her commitment and her caring for women and girls in Afghanistan are inspiring. And in some sense of the word, I think that's what this conference is all about, is learning to care about each other. So it's a great privilege to introduce Mavis Leno. A little note here, it says, please do not touch the computer. <laughs> if I get anywhere near it, somebody tell me. Um, when I uh, when I flew in here yesterday, I had a very nice thing happen to me on the airplane. 
one of the cabin staff came up to me with a check for $30 to help the Afghan women. She told me that. She saw me speaking about this on Larry King a couple of months ago, and she was very broke then and couldn't do anything, but she could afford it now and was thrilled to have the chance to give it to me in person. To me, this says everything about how wide the base of support is in America for the Afghan women. And it also was very nice for me to be able to say to her that the money she gave us is going to go a long way because a dollar is worth a fortune in Afghanistan. Our campaign recently received an anonymous donation of $50,000, which we are using to open a women's center in Bamiyan, which is, some of you may remember, the part of Afghanistan where the Taliban destroyed the beautiful old Buddhist statues. This women's center will include a legal clinic, a shelter for abused women, vocational training, a health clinic for $50,000. Where I live in Los Angeles, you can't build a photo map booth for $50,000. We can do so much good here for so little money, and we urgently need to do it and do it quickly because you know that this country is teetering on the edge. There are great chaotic forces at work in this country. We need to continue to urge our government to have as many on-the-ground peacekeepers as humanly possible so that these chaotic forces do not overwhelm the people that are trying to rebuild what was once, a few decades ago, a constitutional democracy. So every time somebody says nation building, it makes me furious. This is nation restoration. These people had a constitution. They did vote. The women did have equal rights. And the women worked in major professions in great numbers. And those women are still there, and they're still ready to contribute, but they have to have infrastructure to go to. They have to have hospitals reopened so that they can go back and be doctors and nurses and midwives. They have to have schools reopened so that they can go back and be teachers and so that the girls can go back and make up for the lost five and a half years of their education. And they also have to have schools so that the boys do not go anymore to these madrasas that created the Taliban, which in many areas of Afghanistan is the only other option if you want to educate your son. So for what amounts to a minuscule investment in the great scheme of fiscal things, you can literally change the history of the world for the better. And I really think you can't do better than center it on women and girls, because when this country is safe for women and girls, and women and girls are restored to their schooling and their professions, believe me, this country will be safe and stable for everybody. They are the people who are always the most at risk the first to be limited, the first to be abused, the first to be shut out. What happens to them tells us what's happening to that country. And this is their, their huge chance. And it, it would truly be unbearable to me if they don't get this chance. Dr. Seema Samar who heads the Afghanistan Ministry for Women's Affairs and who has worked with us since the very early days of our campaign, um, sent us her budget for six months to do everything that she could possibly dream of for the women and girls of Afghanistan to train up new people, to restore people who are already skilled to the work they did before, to incorporate girls who formerly had no chance at education into an educational system more broadly based and more ready to bring in rural children so that 
they can get a wider base of literacy in that country. The whole thing, everything, the whole shooting match, $66 million. You know, there are people that could donate that just by themselves. They could fund a whole country. It's such a little investment for such a huge reward. My organization works very, very closely with all the small women-run NGOs run by Afghan women in Afghanistan, sometimes run out of Pakistan simply because there's no infrastructure in Afghanistan, uh, but all going to help the Afghan women. And, you know, these women can set up a home school and keep it running for a year for $500. And all we ask is, Come to us, we'll get that money on the ground. We'll put legs on it, it will walk, it will talk, it will change people's lives right now. Because we're talking about small, lean, completely immediate aid workers who know how to do every single thing they have to do to get things done, to how to evade cultural problems in one little province, what the tribal customs are over here that they might have to deal with. Everything that you would never think of yourself, they know. And indeed, our campaign from the beginning has been driven basically by the advice and cultural education uh, given to us by the Afghan women because we wanted very badly to bring them back to the life that had been stolen from them, but only they knew how that might possibly ach be achieved and what that would consist of for them. Um, and we continue to invest in the women of Afghanistan one-on-one -on -one because we still feel they're the ones that know where the money can be used the best, who's in the biggest trouble, what they need to worry about, what they don't need to worry about. Um, I just think that huge philanthropy is wonderful and impactful, but anything that can be done is so much better than doing nothing. Um, I saw an interview with Peter Ustinov once, who ha has worked for many years for UNICEF and has gone many times to war-torn areas to see to it that children get fed and get reunited with their parents if possible and get health care. And he said that in one of these war-torn little hell holes that he was at, a reporter who he had seen many times in other situations like this said to him, you know, with everything that you do, all the aid you bring in and the food and et cetera and et cetera, don't you basically feel that all your efforts are nothing but a drop of water on a hot stove? And he said, no, <clears throat> they're a drop of water in the ocean. They don't disappear. And that is the truth of philanthropy philanthropy, large, small, or in between. And I always say, you never know your luck. History is full of strange twists and changes. And 50 years down the road, we may be asking the Afghan women to come over here and help us. And I can't think of anybody I wouldn't ask more quickly. You don't want to meet a smarter, fiercer, braver bunch of people. So, in conclusion, obviously, we are a resource for everything you could possibly want to do in the way of aiding these women. And I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but if we do not take an extraordinary effort to stabilize this country and bring it back to a real, safe, peacetime democracy where women are equally participant. Because 
if for no other reason their participation is desperately needed, this country can't afford to throw away their skills. Um, then I can tell you for a fact that you might as well go to the local junior high right now and decide which of those kids is going to be fighting and which of those kids is going to be dying in Afghanistan in 10 or 12 years because we'll be doing the same damn thing again if we don't do it right now. Let's turn around the not unjustified worldview that Americans have a very short attention span. Let's dwell on this and do it till the job is done and end up with a friend and an ally in the Islamic world. That would be a brilliant start to a new century. Thank you.